All right. First of all, welcome to Slug 2020. We're excited to bring you this event to you via the live stream and hope that you will enjoy our presentations. I'm Jason Booth, and I oversee the support team here at SCADMD. So just a quick overview of our agenda. You are currently watching the first session. We will be doing four separate sessions. What that means is there will be four different streams. The presentation will remain available for one week after Slug 2020's conclusion through SCADMD's YouTube channel or via the direct links found on the agenda. We do encourage questions during the presentations through the YouTube live chat feature, although SCADMD will be moderating those before relaying them to us, the presenters. Some questions will be delayed to the end of the presentation if they cannot be relayed to, to us in a timely fashion. So please keep in mind there is a five minute delay on the broadcast, which means we the presenters may have moved on to other topics by the time we see those questions. We will defer those questions until the end. I have a great topic to cover with you all today. It has been our tradition over the last several slug conferences to cover what we have nicknamed field notes which are common issues we see from sites we work with. This year's topic is labeled as from the front lines of SLURM support. Now, these field notes are golden nuggets of knowledge that we have collected after working with several sites. So let's talk about the purpose of, of these many topics I'll cover today. The purpose is to show you how to get the most out of your support experience and point you in a better direction while working with Slurm. So just a quick note, Slurm has been around since 2002 and has come a long way since its early days. In the past, Slurm in all caps used to be an acronym which stood for Simple Linux Utility for Resource Management. We do not refer to Slurm in all caps anymore and have, have not done so for many years. The official change happened back in 2012. Officially, occasionally we will we'll see the old styles use. However, this is incorrect. Please just capitalize the S in Slurm and not the entire word. All right, going over my agenda for the presentation. As you will notice, these topics are somewhat grouped together. However, I do split off into more non-related topics towards the end of this presentation. So. I've labeled these as random notes and observations. We will cover best practices when upgrading, adding and removing nodes, a new 2002 feature called ConfigList, which I'm very excited to present to you, some common scheduler parameters related to scalability, and log rotation and database archiving. Continuing on with the agenda, I'll mention highlighted points related to PMIX and PMI2, a note on core dumps, and finally, Fair tree versus classic tree algorithm. All right, upgrading. There's a specific sequence to use when moving between major Slurm releases, which I will go over in the next slide. We have built in support for the last major three releases. So long as you follow this hierarchical sequence, the Slurm DBD needs to be greater than or equal to the Slurm controller and the Slurm controller needs to be greater than or equal to the Slurm D Ds. You can include in here that the Slurm D needs to be greater than or equal to the Slurm Step D if you are upgrading with running jobs, although generally speaking, sites drain the cluster when moving between major releases. Should you choose to upgrade with running jobs, then you want to open a support case, uh, support request with us so that we can assist you with your upgrade needs. So continue on, the Slurm D needs to be greater than or equal to the client commands. Also note that you can mix maintenance releases without issues. So just a note about uh, RPMs. Although we ship and support the Slurm.spec, our general recommendation is to not use RPMs to install Slurm. Instead, we recommend that you use version specific directories and then use sim links on or module files to manage versions. This makes rolling upgrades much simpler. So here is an example of an upgrade procedure we recommend. 
you can see we have an apps directory that we use as the prefix for Slurm. And under the Slurm directory, we have stored the 2002.5 release. To make upgrades easier, you then can use a symlink to the serv serv services you share out to the cluster. In this case, the DBD refers to the Slurm DBD, the CTLD, the Slurm Control D, and the D to the Slurm D. In current, this just reference your current work, uh, version of Slurm. Each of them can then be shared out over a shared file system such as NFS. Make sure to reference these sim links in any service file as well as any environment path through the profile.d or module file. This procedure makes rolling upgrades much simpler just by moving a sim link when you are ready for the upgrade. All right. Backing up the MySQL database used by SlurmDBD is strongly encouraged when upgrading. You should probably be doing this already as part of regular backup, strat regular backup strategy, but this would be a good time to make sure those backup methods work. For example, verify that the MySQL dump command is actually exporting data from MySQL and that the data exported is complete. For large databases or more unusual systems, you can test the upgrade database conversion with a copy of your full production database on a separate machine. This separate system could be a spare blade or VM you have with a later version of Slurm installed. You would restore the database and set the correct Slurm DVD account parameter to point to the database and make sure the test system slurm.conf has the same cluster name. We highly recommend using more recent versions of MariaDBD and MySQL, not only for their security patches, but also for performance and bug fixes. We have seen a handful of bugs reported where the fix for database conversion issues was to upgrade from MySQL or MariaDBD 5.5. All right, Serm DBD will automatically convert the MySQL schema. This can take anywhere from 5, uh, 10, or 15 minutes or more depending on the size of your database and can increase with underlying slow system storage. We highly recommend taking a backup of the state save lo location as well. The state save location and DBD dump can help assist recover from a failed upgrade attempt. Please note that once a daemon has been upgraded, you cannot roll back to a prior major version without the loss of data and or your job queue. Node addition and removal. So adding and removing nodes in Slurm is a sensitive operation. This seems to cause problems for each site at least once early on. Certain internal data structures are built off the node list at startup and are used with the communication subsystems. Changing the node definitions and restarting only the SlurmD will usually lead to communication errors as messages are misrouted internally. Uh, it looks like I have a few questions. Let me jump over here real quick. Update with running jobs. Uh, so, meaning a compute node with uh, when updating SlurmD or running jobs. So, with running jobs, meaning up, updating the SlurmD, so a compute node. So, what Maria, Maria DVD version is recommended? Um, Maria DVD 10, probably just the latest maintenance release of the 10 series is what we'd recommend. Although, really anything past the 5.5, but you don't want to be too far back on, on versions. And it looks like it for right now. Moving along. For adding or removing nodes, we recommend that you first stop the SERM control D, change your config files, and then restart all SERM D processes, and then start the SERM control D. Following this procedure will ensure that the entire cluster has the correct layout for proper communication. Although not the recommended way to add nodes, 
you could change the configs, restart your SRM control D, and quickly restart all the SRMD processes. As a side note, there are plans to make this pr process less painful. However, there is still some work needed, which also relies on us moving away from cons res before that work can take place. Now, onto the exciting topic of configless. I will get into the details here in a moment, but I wanted to take a moment to say that I really believe this is the future of managing CIRM configuration files. I know each site has their own method for, de for deploying configuration changes. I hope that you might consider this feature for your cluster once I am done showing you the benefits. So configless SLURM is a feature that allows the compute nodes, specifically the SLURMD processes, and user commands running on login nodes to pull configuration information directly from the SLURM control D instead of from a pre-distributed local file. This means that there is no need for a shared file system mounted on each compute node housing the configuration files. Your cluster does require a central set of configuration files on the SLURM controller. So configless in one sentence means that, co that compute nodes, login nodes, and other cluster hosts do not need to be deployed with local copies of these files. There's no extra steps required to install this feature. It is built in starting with SRM 2002. Even though there are no additional install steps, there is still a SLURM CTLD parameter called enable configless that you add to your SLURM.conf. Adding this option does require a rest restart of the SLURM controller. The setup on the compute node is just as simple as the server and there are two options available to you to enable this. One, you can start the SLURMD with the dash dash comp dash server or add a DNS SRV record to which is also supported. When using the DNS SRV record, the compute nodes should not have local configuration files on them as this will cause the node to honor what is on the local configuration file over the server issue comp files. We will get into hierarchical order for this in a bit later on into the slide deck. The dash dash comp server will provide the required information to the SlurmD on startup, enabling the service to pull down the needed configuration files. In the example above, the comp server, the server slurm CTLD primary runs on port 6817. For the DNS SRV record, as shown above, Multiple SRV records can be specified if you have deployed SLURM in an HA setup. The DNS SRV entry with the lowest priority should be your primary uh, SLURM control D, with higher, higher priority values for backup SLURM control Ds. As you can see here, I have a visual representation of a basic cluster with the SLURM control D setup with the enable configure SLURM control, uh, control D parameter, a SLURM D, and two client side systems where client commands can be ran. The light blue represents the server where all the SLURM configuration files are stored, and the orangish, orangish, orangish yellow represents the configless client. This includes the SLURM D. Some caution should be taken for client commands. There are basically two ways that work. On nodes with SlurmDs running, it is assumed that you won't have a default SlurmD.conf file, so it just checks in the, in the sync location for one. By default, this is the cache conf directory found in the Slurm spool directory. If you don't have a SlurmD on the node where the client commands are issued, and it can't find a conf file, the last thing it tries is to use the DNS SRV record to look up where the SLURM CTLD is and will request a config. A warning when using just the DNS entry. If you have large groupings of jobs being submitted, you may experience an RPC flood. I will talk about this a little more in a later slide. We generally suggest that you run a SLURMD to manage the cons on the login or submit hosts 
that run client commands and just not let jobs get scheduled on your front end client nodes. In this way, the client commands will pull from local cache storing the configura configuration files. What we are trying to avoid is a bunch of client commands that also need the server to send the configuration files back to them. This obviously does not scale well with many jobs being submitted at once. So this is a continuation of the small configless setup earlier. We have added the SermD processes to the two client nodes. These SermDs can be put in a non-accessible partition accessed by root and hidden from users. This will then allow the client commands to access the configuration files from the shared comp cache directory that is created by the SermD process and avoids having client commands requesting configurations from the server. With this setup, the cluster will perform much better and there will be fewer RPCs. With the SERM control D configured and the SERM D started, you can verify the setup by checking in a couple of places to make sure the, the configs are present on your nodes. Config files will be in the SERM D spool directory underneath the comp cache directory, and a symlink to the location will be created automatically in the slash run slash run slash comp directory. You can confirm that reloading is working by adding a comment to your serm.conf on the serm control D node and running an S control reconfigure and then checking that the con config was updated. Note that there is a hierarchical order to how the serm D and clients behave in configless setup. First, the dash dash conf dash server is checked. Second, the dash F is then checked to see if a valid configuration file was specified. Third, the slurm comp environment variable is checked. Fourth, the default configuration path is checked, most commonly etsy slurm.conf. Lastly, the DNS SRV record is checked. As noted previously, if you are using the DNS SRV record, make sure local copies of the conf comps are not present on those nodes or submit hosts, as they are honored over any DNS SRV records. So here's a slide that covers which comp files are copied over. Note that we do not copy any pound includes files that uh, with this solution. So please take measures to ensure that either one, you consolidate the include configuration files into one, or use some other method to distribute them. There are a few known issues at this time. The Perl API does not work with config lists. This affects sites using the integration scripts. As mentioned already, any include files will, be, will not be distributed with this model. Also, adding and removing nodes is still not supported even with configless at this time. As a final note, and because it does not really fit anywhere else in my presentation, if you still plan to use the traditional method and distribute comp files, please do not ignore conf mismatch errors. When you see these errors, they should be a priority to resolve. My next subject, moving along, is on scalability. There are a number of things you can do to improve the responsiveness of Slurm. I've chosen a select topic to cover, so although this is not a complete list, it does have some very useful information. So I just noticed there's a note about jiras.conf. Um, if you're looking back here at the list, uh, you should see the jiras.conf on the left-hand side, uh, second from the bottom. So yes. All right, to start off the conversation on scalability, I wanted to talk about the state save location. Slurm's per performance and responsiveness under heavy load will be governed by the latency of any read-write operations from the state save location. Special consideration should be taken, especially high throughput environments. You may be better off with having an NVMe drive in a single controller. Some sites use an NFS mount that is also shared with users, and these shares can be frequently taxed. In these setups, you are most likely to see performance issues. 
Another pain point that we see even every so often relates to how often the identity management system is accessed. Hundreds of thousands of queries can cause latency issues and cause jobs to time out with sites that are very active or have a high throughput workload. For this unique uh, case, a CERM provides an NSS Slurm. This optional NSS plugin permits PSSWD and group resolution for a job on the compute node to be serviced through the local Slurm step D process. This includes the Slurm extern step. The advantage here is that a site can reduce the number of queries against LDAP, SSSD, and NSLCD. NSS Slurm is not meant as a full replacement for network directory services such as LDAP, but is a way to remove load from those systems to improve the performance of large scale job launches. Please note that NSS Slurm will only return results for processes within a job step. It, is not, it will not return any results for processes outside of these steps, such as the system monitoring, node health checks, prolog or epilog, and any re related node system processes. Of course, there are other measures you can take to improve your system's responsiveness today. The first, you can, you can turn on caching in NSC or SSSD, or you can tune the scheduler parameters, which I will go over a little later into this presentation. I did say at the beginning of the presentation that we would be going over several disjointed ideas presented here. It is a notable, worthy mention, um, and we do see questions on this subject every so often. That is, what type of hardware does Slurm require? The controller prefers faster, fewer cores with, with fast access to state save, save. The reason for this is listed in the detail above. Slurm does a lot of file access, and that, and that access grows with large sites and large workloads. Note that you can make use of job arrays to help reduce the strain on storage, as this will only store one job script and environment file per entire job array. Continuing on, as mentioned previously, CIRM prefers higher core frequency over core count. The memory depends on the number of jobs your site pushes through in a given day or week, and also depends on if you plan to run the CIRM DVD on the same system as the controller. We generally recommend a system with at least 16 gigabytes of RAM, a dual core CPU with high clock frequency, and a dedicated SSD. This assumes that you are doing about 100,000 jobs a day and about 700,000 jobs a week. For Slurm DVD, we recommend a system with a fast disk, NVMe or SSD, and lots of RAM, 16 to 32 gigabytes. The RAM requirement goes up in relation to the number of jobs you wish to store in query. So I would say the system, this system would be just fine for a site that has 500 nodes and pushes 100,000 jobs a day to 700 thousand jobs in a week. All right, so the next question is, is there a way to throttle user command RPCs? There's a couple of ways. Um, there's a client side job, job submit. We also have a job submit plugin. Um, if you have questions about those, we can go into more detail um, or you can ask and chat and one of our guys can send you a couple links. All right, so the out-of-the-box configuration for the controller is not optimized. For this, we provide a rich set of settings through the, CIRM, uh, the scheduler parameters to help sites fine-tune scheduling and responsiveness. This is not an all-inclusive section around the scheduler parameters, but should give you a starting point. One of the most common problems we see relates to job starvation from the backfill scheduler. Starvation can be mitigated or completely overcome by adjusting an incorrect BF window value. By default, this is set to one day and should be equal to the largest time limit on any partition or QoS within reason. Do not blindly set this to its max value of 30 days. Blindly setting larger values may not be good for your site. Whenever the BF window is configured, you should also adjust, adjust the BF resolution. 
increasing this value can result in faster backfill scheduling as, as larger values reduce the amount of computation required to fit a job within a finite time slot. An example of this would be a BF window of 8 days and a resolution of 10 minutes, the max resolution being an hour. The most common uh, resolutions fall between 300 to 600, 5 to 10 minutes. Tiny jobs will not benefit as much from BF resolution as larger jobs do. In this example, the graph in this slide represents the default BF resolution, which is a small value of 60. The schedule has to consider more finite units of time when the resolution is a smaller number. To represent this, I have the visual graph that I'd made. This does not in actuality represent what is going on inside of the schedule, but conveys the idea of BF resolution. On the x-axis, we have time, which always moves forward. And on the y-axis, we have re resolution, which can grow or shrink depending on your configuration. Note that we have in the top left a block of 5x5, five five, which represents a resolution of 60. The scheduler has to consider a more finite value which increases backfill time due to, due, to, due to the more finite calculations needed for each job. As demonstrated here in this graph, setting a larger resolution reduces granularity of the graph and increases backfill performance since there are not as many fine calculations that need to take place. The blue square, square represents a time when we had resolutions set to 600 and the other quadrants in the graph represents the default resolution when it was configured to the default of 60. Backfill will perform much faster during the time it has had a backfill uh, BF resolution of 600 since the granulator, granulator calculation is not as fine as the default 60. Note that you do not want to just max out this value. However, we have found that values between 300 to 600 are adequate for most sites. Moving along, setting BF continue is also suggested. To best explain BF continue, let's consider a few backfill iterations. At the start of each backfill iteration, the backfill scheduler has a priority order of jobs that it must process through. There are many situations where backfill may not have it uh, make it through the entire list of jobs. This can lead to backfill never scheduling jobs that are near the bottom of a large job queue as demonstrated with the image on the left. The BF continue, with BF continue, it is possible to tell the scheduler to continue processing pending jobs from its original job list after releasing locks, even if job and node states change, as demonstrated with the image on the right. Moving on, although setting time limits is not a scheduler parameter, it heavily influenced the scheduler and thus is worth mentioning. It is next to impossible for the scheduler to give accurate start times if users take the max time value for all of their jobs. Using inaccurate time values will also decrease scheduler performance and throughput. You can configure a default time value, but this should be done as a minimum since users may still only use a fraction of the default time. Finishing up this section, we have some honor, honorable noteworthy mentions. The Skedman interval. This defines how frequency in microseconds the main schedule loop will execute and test any pending jobs. In the, in the example to the right, we set a larger default in order to tune the frequency of scheduling at a significant cost of scheduler system resources. A setting of 50,000 would, would be desirable in a high throughput environment. BF yield interval tells the scheduler how often to relinquish locks during backfill in order for other pending operations to take place, such as handling client commands. There are many more options available to you as admins that I have not mentioned. My hope here was to give you a look into the more common ones we recommend and support. If you have further questions about what is available to, to your site, please open a support request with us.
All right, moving along to log rotation and database archiving. Log rotation and database and database in um, log rotation and archiving of database entities is common through many sites. The Slurm DBD, Slurm Control D, and Slurm D will reload their configuration with a SIG up. Make sure cont files are correct and synced, or you could experience a crash or a failed service start. SIG user 2 is accepted by all the daemons and will cause each respective daemon to reread their log level from the config and reopen the log files. You can use a SIG user 2 with log rotate to manage your site's logs and prevent, prevent them from growing too large. It does not happen very often, but occasionally we will see log files with entries from two years ago. It takes a very unique set of conditions to go unnoticed for that long, but it is possible. Please do not just run an S control reconfigure for this process. The reconfigure only sends the SIG up to reread the configuration and not the needed SIG user 2 to reopen logging. As a quick example, here's a portion of the log rotate script for the SERM CTLD, the SERM D, and the SERM DBD. I realize this may be a little small, and so I would direct you to the SERM.conf man page for a copy and for the details about this example. There's more site can do than just rotate their logs. The Slurm database can grow quite large over time. As an admin, you have some options available to you to help prevent the database from growing too large, namely backing up your database, truncating old usage, job and event data. The Slurm DVD also provides a set of options to automatically purge and archive your data. For sites that still wish to access older data, this information can be stored in a non-production instance of Slurm DVD. The purge options can be used to specify when the purge for a respective entity occurs. The default value for each of these options is to never purge. However, a value of say 12 hours would pur purge everything older than 12 hours. And a purge after 12 months would purge everything older than 12 months. When setting a purge value, it is strongly recommended that you also set the archive dir along with which entities you wish to archive. For example, usage, jobs, and events. Without these, the usage would just be removed and you would lose that information. Telling the Slurm DVD which items you wish to archive is just a yes or no value in the slurmdvd.conf. The archive dir by default is slash temp and can be overridden with the archive script. This script is used to transfer accounting records out of the database into an archive. It is used, to, used in place of the internal processes used to archive objects. Just a side note about archive Slurm DVD instances. This Slurm DVD instance is separate from the archive options just covered. This is an isolated instance of the Slurm DVD that runs a copy or a part um, or a part of a copy of the database from the production system. It is possible to restore an entire copy or part of the production database to some, uh, to some other instance of Slurm DVD. In this way, historical information can still be queried without loading in old archive data files on the production system. If you have questions about this, we encourage you to log a support case with us for details. I guess we have another question coming in. Let me read this over. Any suggestions for how we split off the old data? Just make a copy, bring it up everywhere else, and then set purge on production so it clean up. So this all depends on how many jobs you push through the system, right? Um, for sites that are only doing hundreds of jobs a day, you might be looking at yearly purges, whereas if you're doing a million or even more jobs a week, you may be looking at several months, and it just goes up from there. So um, it really depends on, 
I guess the size of the database you're working with, how many jobs you push through the system. And any recommendations on, on procedures to purge? Um, I would just direct you over to the archiving and, and purge documentation. Um, there are a few parameters in there for the, for the options that we just went over. Um, and like I said, as far as days, it all just depends on how many jobs you push through your system. The next question is, how long is too long to retain accounting DB data? What retention interval starts to become pathological in terms of performance? So, uh, again, it really depends on the requirement of your site, of how long you want to re retain that data. Some sites want to, want to have instant access to the last two years of data, where others only require just the, the last year. Um, with an external CIRM DVD instance, it's possible just to copy over and just have users log into the non-production system and then run their commands to, to query that old historical data. All right, uh, moving on. As we near the end, I have a few more scattered and random suggestions. For sites that make use of MPI jobs, we recommend that you use PMI2 for production. It has a proven track record of being stable and has been tried and, and tested in industry. The use of PMIX should be limited to just testing or massive scale projects. For those sites that use Intel MPI, Intel supports PMI2 in more recent 2019 versions, but not older versions, so it is recommended that you upgrade to make use of the added support for PMI2. A few random suggestions related to core files. We hope you never get one, but should you, we recommend knowing the location of your core dumps. If CIRM CTLD is started with the dash D option, then the core files will be written to the current working directory. If the slurm ctld log file is an absolute path, the core files will be written to this directory. Otherwise, the core file will be written to the state save location or var temp as a last resort. Please make sure that the core dump location is accessible by the slurm user and that the user has write permission on that directory. If none of the above directories have write permissions for Slurm user, no core file will be pr uh, produced. For testing purposes, the command sctrl abort can be used to abort the Slurm control daemon and generate a core file. There are other considerations. Please see our FAQ page for further details. Moving on to my next random point, for sure. So there are differences between Fairtree and classic algorithms, and depending on what your site values, you may consider one over the other. For classic, the priority can be all over the place, and it's possible for a lower utilization user in a high utilization count to have a higher fair share value than a user in an underutilized under account. For the Fairtree algorithm, which is on by default in the more recent version starting in 1905, different accounts have contained usage. So usage and priority is determined at the account level. And the users under the account will then fight for priority amongst themselves. This is a more fine-grained level of priority and usage at the account level. So in this example, user Bob wants to see his usage. By default, S share dash L. Uh, by running S share dash L and formatting the output, Bob can see that he has a usage of 0.75. Note that the level FS values are infinite if the association has no usage, which you can see just right over there. One more note about classic fair tree. With the classic fair share algorithm, Usage in an account affects the priority of other users in the same account by default. With depth oblivious flag, each user's fair share is also affected by their own usage. So those who use classic 
there's a uh, flag for you to consider. Fair tree algorithm is the default since 1905. What makes this different from classic is that priors are divi divided into tiers by account. Priorities of users within an account will be higher or lower relative to each other, but the priority of a user in a higher utilization account will never be higher than a user in a lower utilization account. As a conclusion of classic versus fair tree, it honestly comes down to what your site values the most. We believe that fair tree will be the most desirable for most sites, and this is one reason it is on by default. However, should you need the classic al algorithm, then you can enable this with the priority flags, no fair tree. As we are now at the end of these field notes, I want to thank you. We will now move on to our question and answer session. All right, uh, another question. Is it possible to exempt a particular partition from fair share usage calculations? Um, that I do not know. Um, so if one of our other engineers in the chat does have input, I'd be appreciative if you could reply to that one. All right. Um, will S control reconfigure work to add nodes in the cluster, either with or without config lists? No, you still need to follow that same procedure. Um, the data structures are pretty static when it comes to the nodes, and our communication, the way we handle that, is built off that static list. So you're going to need to, to follow that same procedure. Stop the control D. Um, and the CERM Ds, bring up the CERM Ds with the new CERM.conf and added nodes, and then the CERM control D. Are there any downsides to using config lists? If you're using the integration scripts at this time, um, those do not work. Um, however, the, the benefits, um, you get more benefit than, than the downsides. The only downsides would be the, the, the include files that you have on your site. Um, those end up getting rolled into the main config files. Or if you have pound includes, you need to distribute them through, like, say, an NFS server out to the compute nodes so that those can resolve correctly. Does config list enable some caching in case of network, uh, transient network issues? So, the config files are stored on the local system where the CERMD, CERMD runs, and we keep a copy of those. So should any network outages happen, there is a stored copy of those config files, and if for some reason you can access the controller or communication between the CERMDs will still persist, because they'll have that copy there. So it seems like as long as you have NSCD along with NSLCD, uh, shouldn't need NSS Slurm. Uh, it just depends on your workload um, and how high throughput the system is. If you're dealing with uh, millions of jobs, that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of uh, coring of the identity management system. So, y if you see slowdowns, you may want to consider NSS Slurm. But if things are working uh, correctly for your site, then you probably don't need it at this time. Uh, let's see here. Any thoughts to a slurm.conf validator? Test slurm CTLD startup without the pain of failing. Uh, we've talked about this. Um, we don't have anything to present to you at this time, but know that we have brought this up internally in internal conversations at different points. So it's something that's on our minds, but we don't have anything at this time to share with you. So is there a setting to help when a user submits tens of thousands of jobs and block the queue. Um, in S Account Manager, you can set a max job for that user. Uh, that seems to work for most sites. Um, let's see. 
the other options are to do the client side job submits. Um, you could do some things there to, to throttle or uh, some checking and then reject jobs on the client side. Uh, but note that users could still circumvent that since that is client side. So setting something in the database such as max job is probably the preferred method there. Uh, is there any documentation available to describe how to regularly uh, migrate records from an active DVD to an archived DVD? Um, no, we don't really have that documented on our website, uh, but if you have questions, open a support case and uh, our support engineers can work with you on that. Can you combine config lists with keeping regular config files on hosts like login nodes? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, just file, f follow that hierarch hierarchical order. Config files can be stored locally, um, so long as the CERMDs don't have that uh, conf um, switch set on them. And then the next question is there an uh, analog to debt oblivious for Fairtree? Um, I'll have to rely on one of our other support engineers to apply to that in chat. All right, it looks like that's probably the end of the questions. So I want to thank you all for attending this first session of Slug 2020. The next presentation is by Brian Christensen with Cloud and Stuff, which will start at 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time and is on a separate YouTube live stream. Please see the uh, Slurm, uh, Slurm, SaskatchewanMD so Slurm YouTube channel for the links or the slug agenda. Thank you all for watching.